Vikings. It's first chapter Friday. Yay! And today we're going to be reading 96 Miles by J.L. Elpson. Um, this is a new book. It's an adventure section. Dad always said if things get desperate, it's okay to drink the water in the toilet bowl. I never thought it would come to that. I thought I'd sooner die than let one drop of toilet water touch my lips. Yet here I am, kneeling before a porcelain throne, holding a tin mug for scooping in one hand and my half-gallon canteen in the other. Don't worry, I'm going to boil it first. Behind me, my brother Stuart is making gagging noises. I'm going to throw up, he says, which is something Stu says all the time. But does he ever actually throw up? No, he does do most of the things he says he's going to do, like run away or kill himself or kill me. Come on, John, do we really need this, he says. I stop mid-scoop and stare up at him, holding back the pink padded toilet seat with my elbow. No, we do not need it, Stu. I just thought, oh, look, water from a toilet. That sounds refreshing. Let's drink it. His sullen dark eyes narrow at me, and I thrust the canteen into his hands. He kneels down to help me, but adds in a mumble, We have two canteens of water already. And that's a perfect example of how my brother thinks. Two canteens of water, and we have a three-day walk down an empty stretch of desert highway before we reach Breton Ranch, our last chance for help. I'm no math genius, but before this ugly pink toilet came along, I figured we were short in the water department. It isn't Stu's math skills I'm questioning, though. If we'd found a pantry full of Aquafina in this abandoned shack of a home, Stu would have never been the first one to start filling his pack. He knows how desperately we need water. What I'm questioning is, is the willingness to do anything hard, or in this case, anything revolting, in order to save himself. Yet we are raised by the same dad, who preached self-reliance on pretty much a daily basis. I wouldn't have predicted that about Stuart. He's younger than me by two years, but he's always had a lot of more determination when it comes to stuff like this. My dad calls it a strong mental fortitude. I couldn't say what my strengths are. I guess I'm good at yard maintenance and, according to my school counselor, using sarcasm to avoid conflict. And now that I think about it, I'm not exactly sure she meant that as a compliment. But my point is, in the face of real natural disaster or a terrorist attack or zombie apocalypse or whatever the heck happened 21 days ago that caused all the power to go out, I would have predicted that Stuart would be the one talking me into doing hard things, not the other way around. Anyway, it's not like I want to drink toilet water, boiled or not, but the choice do we have? What's the alternative? It's not like we're in a restaurant and the waiter's asking, would you like bottled water or the toilet water from the creepy abandoned bathroom? My mug scrapes the bottom of the porcelain bowl as I scoop the last of the water, and before I can stop myself, I give the bare toilet a quick inspection. It looks clean for the most part, other than the faint rust-colored ring where the water level once was. The water itself doesn't look bad either. Still, it's the suffocate seed that we have to worry about. Stu is doing a bad job of holding the canteen over the bowl. There's no surprise. He's got this disgusting look on his face, and he's checking out the dirty corners of the small bathroom. I already told him not to look too closely. The place kind of creeps me out with its cracked vinyl floor and some bleached lace curtains, like something frozen in time, like something out of a horror movie. Move closer, I said impatiently, motioning for Stu to bring the canteen over to the bowl. He does it with a shaky hand, so I end up spilling toilet water on his fingers, and his fault. Ha! Oh, gross! He says, jerking the canteen back. He switches hands and then wipes his wet one down the side of my pant leg before I can stop it. Real mature, I say. Real mature, he mimics. We've been together too long. Before I realize what he means to do next, Stu is on his feet, up in the canteen, dumping all the water I just collected back into the toilet. Stop! I yell, jumping up and making go grab for the now in the canteen. What are you doing? We don't need this, he insists, hiding the canteen behind his back. Like he's a 10-year-old or something. He's 11, which may not seem that much older than 10, but I swear, under normal circumstances, he's the oldest 11-year-old I know. We could end up finding one of those hot springs along the way. You never know. Or we could find a chocolate battery with a chocolate river inside, I say. Stu looks up like he wants to hit me. What, am I not allowed to come up with a what-if scenarios as well? He does this heavy side thing that he's been doing a lot lately. I think we should stop at the reservoir for water, he says. It's only a short detour. The short detour he's talking about is 16 miles out of the way. I don't know if he's thinking about this in terms of walking, but I've already made up my mind that we aren't stopping at the reservoir. With the supplies we have, and I'm including toilet water, we'd be lucky for at least three days out there in the desert. So we're going three days to get the Brighton Ranch. We can't afford to add 16 more miles to our already insanely long walk. We'll decide about the detour when we get to the turnoff, all right, I say. He nods reluctantly, but I can tell he sees right through me. For now, we have to take as much water with us as we can. I hold out my hand for him to give me the canteen, and he sighs without handing it over. 
I should be the one sighing, not him. Do you want us to survive or not? I say, throwing my hands up in frustration. But one look at Stu's face, and I regret asking. What's the point of surviving? He shouts at the low ceiling. His question freaks me out. It really, really freaks me out. Because I'm not sure there's a point to this anymore at all. But I'm not going to tell him that. Instead, I say, I told you I would get you across the desert. All right? All you have to do is trust me. You mean all I have to do is lie to myself? All I have to do is pretend I'm not already a goner? My chest tightens with familiar dread. Don't say stuff like that. That was part of our deal, remember? I'm going to get you across the desert, and you're not going to say stuff like that. He stares at me, and he's thinking about pushing me a little further, and I can tell by the tick of his jaw, but then he says, fine, I trust you. I don't believe him. He doesn't trust me at all. I mean, if he did, he wouldn't be acting like this, right? He wouldn't be calling himself a goner, but I decided to drop it, pretend I believed him. It's like an annoying dry spot on the back of my throat that won't go away. If I pretend it isn't there, then it doesn't bother me so much. But I let myself think about it, even for a second. Then I become obsessed with working my tongue against words in my mouth, trying to gather up enough saliva to quench it. So yeah, sometimes you're better off ignoring things you can't do anything about. Listen, I finally say, I'm going to give you a clean water. I go to the pack I left against the chipped bathtub and hook one of my full canteens. I walk it over to him, but he won't take it. He just stares at me with hard eyes and a clenched jaw. I sit down next to his pack and find his empty canteen opposite his full one and switch it out for my full one. Your pack's evened out now. Without looking at him, I, I don't mind the toilet water. Positioning myself in front of the bowl again, I unscrew the plastic cap of Stu's canteen grab my mug and start feeling. Stop it, John. Stop what I say, focusing on the near opening. Stop acting like I'm some helpless baby and it's your job to save me. I open my mouth ready to disagree with him. But nothing comes out. I've never thought of Stu as helpless before, but lately that's exactly how he's been acting. So I guess I've been acting like it's my job to save him. Isn't it though? Before I can come up with a response that will snap him out of his mood, I hear a noise outside. Stu hears it too. I can tell by the look on his face, the way his whole body tenses up. If this was just your average, everyday, massive power outage that we were dealing with, the sound of footsteps on gravel outside wouldn't exactly send up alarm bells. But two days ago, everything was taken from us. And I mean everything that Stu and I needed to survive this blackout, including a decade's worth of drying canned goods that my dad had been hoarding away in all six of his 55-gallon water tanks. If my dad had been around... He would have taken a bullet for those water tanks. Maybe Stu is remembering our water tanks because he's suddenly eager to protect what we found first. The toilet water. He crouches down next to me and picks up the empty canteen he tossed aside moments ago and motions for me to hurry and finish with the one I'm working on. Like it's all of a sudden Evian. I got everything I could out of the bowl, so I set down my mug and quickly closed the canteen, handing it off to Stu. Then I shut the toilet seat and quietly lift the lid off the back tank. As I'm doing that, I check out the window, craning my neck both ways, but the early morning sun is glaring off the dirty glass and I can't see who's out there. I hear them, though. It's a shack of a home, an abandoned double-wide trailer, and a patch of trees about a mile from our property line. The walls are like paper mache, the whole house like a giant panada waiting to be crushed. I can hear muffled voices speaking to each other now, and footsteps treading through the gravel around the side where this entry is. I hear the rusty spring of the screen door opening, and then the high-pitched squeak of metal hinges. Stu's beside me with the mug and the empty canteen. Any motions for me to get out of his way so he can take over? I nod and move silently to my pack, wiping away the sudden trickle of sweat in my brow. I unzip a side pocket and pull out a long hunting knife. Adrenaline has kicked in and I feel blood rushing below my surface and my skin. Still, my hand is visibly shaking. I grip the knife and position myself in front of the open bathroom door, ready to strike, ready to take down whoever comes around the corner, I think. But then I hear something that causes me to make a split-second decision. Standing up today, I reach behind my back and have my knife slipping it blade down into my waist and my jeans. So I appear unarmed, and just as I do, a kid wanders into view. I wonder what the kid's going to do. What are Stu and his brother going to do? I wonder, wonder what's going to happen. Are they going to make it across the desert? 96 miles. If you want to find out what happens, come check it out. I hope you enjoyed this first chapter of Friday, and I will see you guys again next week for another installment.